G'day and welcome to this week's recording. It's fantastic to have you join us. If you're not part of the Mentone Baptist Church community, a special welcome to you. And we would love for you to connect with us. So please check out the website and send us an email or give us a phone call and we'd love to be in touch. Well, today we're continuing our series on the book of Colossians. And today's passage, Paul gets incredibly practical. He, uh, he provides wonderful clarity about what it is to follow Jesus and the destiny that awaits us. And so, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Helen, who's going to lead us in a time of prayer and also read the passage for us. Thanks, Helen. We're going to pray together. Please join me. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Father, we come before you as sinners this morning, acknowledging your holiness and our inability to meet your perfect standard. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. May we mourn over our prideful selfishness and may, your, may you comfort us, Jesus, with the assurance that your blood washes away all our sin and makes us whiter than snow. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Lord, in this world that values self-promotion and arrogance, please make us a people who display gentleness and kindness, putting others' needs above our own. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Please help us to recognise that we need your word even more than food and water. We acknowledge that you alone can truly satisfy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Lord, you are merciful and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Please help us to forgive all those who have hurt us and wronged us, just as you have forgiven us so freely through your Son. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Thank you, Father, that by your Holy Spirit, you are producing these fruit in our lives, the fruit of mercy, purity and peace. May we be salt and light in our homes, workplaces, schools and neighbourhoods. We lift up to you those among us who are sick, suffering, unemployed, lonely or fearful. Please comfort and strengthen them and give them your perfect peace. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Lord, we commit to you all of our brothers and sisters who live in places where it is difficult or illegal to meet together, read your word, or to share your good news with others. We thank you for sustaining them. Please give them courage and wisdom and peace as they continue to stand firm for you, trusting that you are their rock and refuge and have the ultimate power and authority. All of these things we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The Bible reading comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 14. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived. But now, you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. 
Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I'm looking forward to looking at God's word with you today. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through to 14. It's often argued that Michelangelo's statue of David is the perfect form of man. The dimensions are the ideal. The geometry and the measurements from hand to foot, from head to foot. uh, The circumference of the torso. It's all sculptured with precision. Michelangelo, of course, not only had a great eye for artistic detail. uh, He was a mathematician. He is someone who understood geometry. He was also an expert in anatomy and the human body. And all these things aided him in carving out the perfect form of a man. The only problem with this form is that David stands at almost four metres in height, uh, a little taller than myself. Uh, But we all have images, don't we? In our minds, in our imaginations of what the ideal person looks like. We all have an image of the person we most want to be like. Well, in Colossians chapter 3, God presents an image that is truly wonderful. And the image is of Christ in you, of God making us more like him. So let us pray and look at this passage of scripture together. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you and praise you for your word And we do ask that today your word may do a good work in our own hearts and minds. Please God, show us Jesus, increase our confidence in him, and make us more like him. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin today by directing our attention to the middle verses in our Bible reading for today. Uh, These verses illuminate what God is doing in our lives as Christians. And I think it's big news. It is breathtaking. So looking at verses 10 and 11. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the image, sorry, in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So the image of its creator, that is the image of God. Our image of God is the very first thing God says about humanity when he made us. So the very first thing that he says about man and woman in the Bible, back in Genesis chapter 1, is about this image. So Genesis chapter 1, God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then we have this wonderful refrain at the end of this creating. God saw it and he said, It is was very good. It's very good. Now, of course, we know that this image has been marred by sin. It's broken. Now, we still image God, but now it's a faulty and disfigured image, like like a broken mirror that's been cracked. But now turn in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. And in a verse that we were looking at a couple of months ago, we read this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God. So Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is God and he represents God. Jesus is the image of God, but without any distortion, without any cracks. And as a human being, Jesus shows us what it means to be an image bearer of God. And he reveals how far we have fallen short. Now, the difference between Jesus and ourselves is he is the image of God. Whereas the Bible says of us, we were made in the image of God. And that distinction is all important. But the exciting thing is, and and one of the glories of the gospel is this, God is renewing his image in us. He is restoring that image. He is healing it. He is repairing it. Verse 10 again, back in Colossians 3. We've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. 
God has taken us. We who were sinful and spiritually poor, who had nothing to offer God, and he, he took us and he washed us, he forgave us, he welcomed us, he clothed us, he's restoring us. We are being restored in the image of the creator, of God. And so what was undone by the fall, Christ is putting back together because of his death on the cross. What sin destroyed, the Lord Jesus is healing and renewing. So all those thousands of years of sin and death and all those years of sin in our own lives, it can't resist the power of the gospel and the sufficiency of Jesus' death and resurrection. Through Christ, God is restoring humanity into his image. And Paul wants the Colossians to see this is who we are now. This portrait God is painting is of us. Now Paul notes this restoration has significant implications for some of the old divisions. Look at verse 11 with me. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. So the great division in the Old Testament and even in, during Jesus' days uh, in public ministry, it was between the Jew and the Gentile. The world was divided between Jews and Gentiles. But Paul's statement here is, is collapsing that great divide. And then he elaborates the circumcised and the uncircumcised. So circumcision was the mark of someone who belonged to the Old Covenant. He adds, no barbarian. Right? Barbarian was an insult for non-Greek speaking people. For uncultured people, uncivilized people, you'd call them a barbarian, a babbler. It was an insulting term. And then he adds, no Scythian. Uh, Scythians were a group of people who lived in northern Greece and, and across the Black Sea area. And they were considered even lower than the barbarian. Now, Paul's not arguing that all these different people groups cease to exist, as though your ethnicity no longer exists. But what he's saying is that through the gospel, all these people divisions and, and the denigration of people is just gone. It's dissipating. And then he says, slave or free. There is no slave or free. That's a timely reminder, isn't it? In the ancient world, slaves were not regarded as people, but as property. And of course, that was true for many forms of slavery that are closer to our own time and that still exist in parts of the world today. But these categories are being blown up by the gospel. You know, to the person who thinks that one race of people is inferior to another or one is superior to another. Or to those who judge another human being because of the color of their skin or the language they speak. Or to those who are defining someone's worth because of their mental abilities or their lack of their mental abilities or, or the education they have received. These things come crashing down through the gospel. And then Paul is almost like he's shouting out, but Christ is all and is in all. Meaning Jesus is all that matters and he is in all. That is all those who are in Christ, those who are generally born again. You know, what are the, the realities that should adorn the Christian church and that should draw people to Christ, whether black or brown or white, but to draw us together, to be one people, the educated, the not so educated, the mentally disabled, the high functioning, the young, the old, to be one people. It is Christ. This wonderful declaration, Christ is all and is in all. And as we as a church live this out and express this, we are showing the world good news of what God can do. Churches have, I think, a unique opportunity to, uh, to repudiate racism by teaching this image bearing and by practicing this Christ-centered oneness. You know, if the community wants to see what a truly united group of people can be like, the church ought to be that sign. Now, if you are trusting Jesus for the forgiveness of sin, you are reconciled to God by faith. You, and that means you are a new person. Now, you have the same name and the same personality and same physical attributes, and you might have the same job and the same group of friends. But Paul, in this passage, explores that, well, you've died, though, to sin. 
And you're going to have new attitudes and new desires. There's some change in lifestyle. You might have new sets of habits, new interests. And what's happening, you see, is God is restoring you in his own image. Uh, Big Ben is one of the iconic images of London. The British Parliament buildings with uh, the Elizabeth Tower standing tall at one end uh, with you know, that famed clock with the Big Ben. Yeah, it's one of the most recognisable images in the entire world. When we visited London a couple of years ago, the tower was hidden by all the scaffolding because of a major restoration taking place. And underneath all of that scaffolding, uh, the clock dials were reglazed, all four of them. The carved stonework was cleaned up and repaired and the ironwork was repainted. But to restore Big Ben to its original uh, glory and state, it took a lot of time and a lot of effort. It was two long years of people painstakingly pulling apart the machinery and cleaning it and repairing it and adding new things and repainting everything. It was slow work. But it gradually it was completed and it was completed for New Year's Eve in 2019. And so the scaffolding came down and Big Ben sounded once again. You see, God is restoring us by his spirit. He's working in our lives and that work will one day be finished. And all the scaffolding will come down and God will give us our resurrection bodies and we'll see the true glory of what God has done. He will finish the work he's begun in our lives. But it, it is a slow work. It is a gradual work. It's a painstaking work. So with that wonderful image in mind, that God is restoring his own image in us, to keep that front and centre, knowing that's who we are now in Jesus, Paul in this passage is going to argue you need to do two things. You need to die to the old self and you need to put on the new self. Now, as we look at these verses, I want to stress Christianity is not a moral examination as though you need to pass a test to win God's approval and get a ticket to heaven. I understand that is how many non-Christians understand Christianity. It's how many Christians portray Christianity. You know, be good, be moral, avoid the really nasty sins so that your good outweighs the bad. And hopefully it's enough to get you into heaven. It's an awful and gross misrepresentation, though. See, the Christian is going to live a different life because of who we are now. Our life is different because God has saved us. So what we're going to read now in these verses about putting, on, uh, sorry, putting off old attitudes and actions and putting on the new, this is the outcome, the result of this new life we have in Jesus because he has saved us, because God has forgiven us. So firstly, let's take a look at putting off the old self. I'm going to read from verse 5. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. Paul says, kill off these things. They're like poison to you. Don't put yourself in a position where you, you know you're going to be tempted and you can't resist those old ways. He says, didn't he, uh, you used to walk this way. That was like the pattern of life you used to lead. But now you're walking in a new direction, in a new direction. So maybe part of the, 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 what you need to do is to make that decision. You, maybe you need to make that conscious decision each day. I'm not going to head down that old path anymore. I'm not going to go down that old way. Instead, I am going in a new direction. Interestingly, Paul says all of these things are idolatry. That is, they amount to worshipping a false god. They're creating a false vision of what life is about and what you want to live for and love most. So he describes lust and impurity, greed, and all these things being idols and destructive. And he adds, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath or the anger of God. It's a reference to the coming judgment where God will judge and punish with absolute fairness. 
The wrath of God says how you, li- how you live matters. It has consequence for how we live our lives today. But notice the emphasis, you used to walk in those ways. The very people who God forgives and is now transforming into his image, these are the same people who used to sleep around, who used to entertain all kinds of sexual preferences. They used to be greedy. Maybe it was greedy for money or possessions or food or whatever it is. But Christ came into the world to save sinners, didn't he? God doesn't save saints. He loves and forgives and makes new sinners. We are to leave these ways behind. Verses 8 and 9, he includes uh, more sins, doesn't he? Rid ourselves of anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. I wonder, are you someone who loses their temper? Do you react to people with that over-the-top voice? And with words, maybe your arms and hands. Are you someone who holds a grudge? Do you get back at people with your words? And perhaps no, not so subtly talking about them behind their own back. Do you use filthy language? You swear, you use obscene words, degrading humour. These things belong to the old self, not to the new. Those sins don't fit you. They don't suit who you are now in Christ. I think one of the temptations we face is that why we, while we recognize these things as sinful and we don't want to live them out anymore, what we often do is we take them off, but only just to throw them in the cupboard for a rainy day. You know, after all, you know, old-fashioned returns eventually, doesn't it? I'm sure you've all seen the mullet making a comeback. I mean, can you believe it? The mullet of all things. All these kids at school are growing mullets. There are footy players who are parading around with with their own mullet. I mean, who on earth was thinking, oh, the mullet, yeah, that's kind of (laughs) cool. Let's start that trend up again. Now, I apologize to all the mullet-inspired men out there, but it's bad, right? Cut it off. Get rid of it. Take the the necessary action, that's what Paul is saying, take the necessary action to put the old self to death. Don't just put it in the cupboard, get rid of it altogether. Remove alcohol from your house if that's what you need to be godly. Set up an accountability system on your internet usage if you need that to help you be godly. Burn the wardrobe. Now, God is not asking us, though, to take off the old and now we're just like standing there in the middle of the room all naked. Now, if you're naked and you're feeling the cold and you're all exposed, what are you going to do? You're going to rush to your room, put something on. And if the only thing you have is the old set of clothes, then that's what you're going to put on. So if the only way that you know how to speak is to use expletives all the time, that's what you'll use. If your habit is to respond to someone who's hurt you by hurting them back maybe being angry or slandering them, and you don't know of another way to respond, that's what you will do. But one of the wonderful things that God is saying in this passage is, it's not only about taking off the old set of clothes, he says, put on the new. God has given us a brand new wardrobe. He's given us a new way of thinking, a new way of speaking, a new way of living, and it's better. So if you look down at verse 12, just hear Paul's tone as he writes to these believers in Colossae. He says, dearly loved. This isn't the the legalist songbook. This isn't the screaming preacher who's going on about the law. This isn't the angry parent losing it with his kids. Paul sees this, this community of believers and he recognizes them. He says, you are God's chosen people. And again, even as he says it, hear the grace of God. Who are the people that he's talking about? God has chosen adulterers, failing and broken, sinful people, angry, the selfish, the dishonest. And he chose us while he knew everything about us. Paul says, you are God's chosen people. 
you are dearly loved. Verse 12, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We're not only putting the old wardrobe, um, burying it in the backyard or burning it. We have a new set of clothes. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. The more we know God, the more we understand the gospel, the more we will become like God and want to become like God. You know, we become like the people we spend time with. We start to emulate or copy the people that we hang around with or that we watch on television. Now, sometimes we do this consciously. We see uh, an attribute in somebody else and I think, oh, that's kind of cool. I want to try and mimic that myself. Other times we do it subconsciously. Other people's words just rub off on us or someone's attitude just rubs off on us. The people we spend time with, they influence our own attitudes and words and actions. And the the same is true for us with, with God. The more we're spending time with God in his word and time with his people, we will become more like him. And that's how we clothe ourselves with this new wardrobe. In verse 13, bear with each other, forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. There are times when as a church there are are disagreements. There are misunderstandings. There are squabbles. In a Bible study group or among friends, there's a bit of a falling out. There's a disagreement and you just can't get along. Or even at home, in your marriage, or with the children, conflict arises. This is one of the great Bible passages for dealing with conflict and responding to disappointment and hurt. Let's look at it again. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Again, we are to forgive as God has forgiven us. How great is God's forgiveness toward us? Well, the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, that is how far he has removed our transgressions from us. Is there someone you need to forgive? Have you sinned against somebody and you need to repent? Is there someone with whom you need to move toward reconciling? Paul doesn't say that the hurt is unimportant. He doesn't say we just can you know, sweep sin away under the carpet. He doesn't say that. But rather what's going on is that God is giving us a new pattern for living. It is a better pattern for living. A, a pattern of life that reflects who we are now as God's image bearers. You know, in our world today, there is so much impatience and anger Social media, if you're on it, perhaps we shouldn't be. It's just so uh, toxic at times. Social media is mostly about heat and emotion. There's almost no room these days for calm, for reflection, for nuance. It's made up almost entirely with people who are boasting about whatever they've done or they're expressing envy or there are people shouting out just the most awful things and words to other people. God's people are to be distinct. Our clothes are different. They are distinctive and they are good. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. These things are attractive and they can also have an effect on people around us and and melting someone else's anger or subduing that, that, that chorus of disgust that everyone seems to be singing from all the time. In verse 14, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Paul is not asking us to put on love as the culture defines love or love in some sort of vague notion of niceness. It's God's love he's talking about. Love that is defined by God and what God is like. Love that is holy. Love that is truthful. Love that is merciful. 
And Paul says this love of God binds all of the other things together in perfect unity. Right? So forgiveness comes from love. Gentleness stems from love. Patience is about being loving. And you will actually find that each of these qualities will work together and strengthen each other. It's kind of like having a matching shirt and pants and shoes and hat and glasses and, and it all works together in this harmonious whole. Nothing clashing, nothing looking out of place. It's like Yves Saint Laurent, not Daggyville. Now, of course, if you're anything like me, uh, I'm often blinded to you know, some of the sins in my life, some of my own weaknesses. And the default reaction is often to grab hold of that which is most instinctive in me. I'm going to grab what's closest to me, what's ever close at hand. And I think this is one of the reasons why we as Christians deal with issues sinfully. Because we're, we've become accustomed to handling these things in a certain way. Everyone's got a default, you see. And you fall back onto whatever your, mo your, your default is when you're vulnerable, when you're hurt. But what God is doing and has done is change the default position. He's made us a new person by His Spirit. And what Paul is encouraging us to do is to create as much distance between the old self and the new self as possible. And the further we are away from those sinful tendencies, the less we're going to bring them out. The more we put them out of reach, out of sight, the less likely we're going to look for them and bring them back into the picture. And it's not, again, just about leaving those things uh, away, but the more that we're practicing the good, the more that we're focusing on what is good, the more of a habit those things will become, and the more normal it becomes for us to respond with kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Now, if you're not a Christian, these things are not yet true for you. The wrath of God is coming. And the only way to escape is for us to run to Christ. Ask God for his forgiveness and ask him to redeem your life. And if you are in that position, the greatest plea that you can ever have is to ask God to forgive you and to change you. And that's a prayer God loves to answer with a yes. If you are a Christian, don't give up putting off and putting on. I understand there are times when we will fail. Only in heaven are we going to cease to sin ever again. But also understand, even today, we no longer need to sin. And we can make progress. We can make progress against addiction and lust and anger and greed. We can make progress. We can grow in kindness and patience and gentleness. In all those lists that we've been reading here in Colossians chapter 3, maybe one of those items in particular has stood out to you. Or it's confronted you. And maybe that's the case because it's true of you. Either because there is that sin that is still taking hold in your life, or of those wonderful godly uh, virtues, some of those things are missing in your life. If one of these things has stood out to you today, please don't dismiss it. God is challenging you, correcting you, because he loves you. Do something about it today. Acknowledge your sin to God and repent. Share it with somebody today so that they can help keep you account and to encourage you to keep putting on this new set of clothes. But why do we do it? Why do we continue to put to death sin and to put on the new self? Friends, remember that incredible, wonderful portrait that God gives us in verses 10 and 11. This is who we are now in Christ. God is restoring His image 
in us. Look at this portrait that God is painting and be encouraged to keep putting off the old self and to be putting on the new. Thank you, Murray. Such a practical passage calling us to put off the old self, burn it up, cut off the mullet if you've got one, and to put on the new, make it the new default, being renewed day by day into the image of God. And may, as Murray suggested, may, maybe you should try and share one thing that God's put on your mind. Share it with someone this week. Confess it to God and seek to try and put on that new clothing, that new pattern of life. Let us pray. Please pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you so much. We thank you so much that you are a God who, who forgives, who does not hold things against us. When we come to you, when we, we confess our sin to you, when we trust in you and we find our identity in Christ. Father, we pray that you would help us to walk in these ways, to, to rid ourselves of the old and to put on the new. Help us to put on love and live lives that give glory and honour to you in response to the way that you have forgiven us. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us this week. And until next week, God bless.